All right, let's roll. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, tonight we have as our featured presenter, Kevin McLaughlin. This is going to be his first uh, presentation to the WAS. He has worked in dynamics and controls for more than 30 years. He graduated from Wayne State with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and got his master's in mechanical engineering from Purdue. He, has, he worked for TRW Aerospace in Redondo Beach, California, after Purdue, and relocated to Maryland in 1989 to work on the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, one of NASA's great observatories. Uh, he was involved in the validation of attitude control, which he's going to be talking about. I won't cover any more of that. But uh, after a year of on-orbit operations with GRO, he joined TRW Automotive and was involved in all aspects of TRW's electric steering program. His experience since then has been as director of engineering at both TRW and Hyundai Mobis, and he was honored at TRW as a technical fellow. He has 17 patents and 18 publications across a wide range of technical areas, including automotive safety, motor control, steering control, and satellite control and operations. His patents are embodied in over 35 million automotive steering systems worldwide. Kevin retired from Hyundai Mobis in 2016 and is now taking physics classes at Wayne State. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Kevin a warm welcome. And uh, Jeff Bridges gave this kind of wandering, entertaining talk. And then Harrison Ford came on and said, uh, Nobody told me I had to follow Jeff Bridges. So <laughs> I kind of feel the same way. <laughs> it was good talk, and uh, hope, hopefully, mine will be as good. So, thank you. You're very welcome. Oh, you really started something now. One second, little. Um, I'm going to talk. Uh, let's see if I can get this. Uh, Gary had a similar issue with No, sorry, I just had to plug this in. There you go. Operations problem, as we'll talk about later. Um, so, what I'm going to do is I'll give you just a brief overview of gamma ray astronomy, just to give you a little baseline. I will. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the Gamma Ray Observatory specifically, its history, its life cycle, some of the, uh, and the Great Observatory Program, which there's not a lot to talk about at NASA uh, very much anymore, and then major findings of the, of the GRO. We'll call it GRO, Gamma Ray Observatory. Um, and then the main part of the talk will be about the satellite that supported the science mission and how it functioned. Um, gamma, what is a gamma ray? Gamma ray is just electromagnetic radiation. It's the most intense electromagnetic radiation. Um, so we start up here with radio waves, microwaves, and infrared, then we move into the visible light spectrum that we, we can see, ultraviolet x-rays and gamma rays. And this is obviously not um, to scale, it's, a, it's a logarithmic scale, so um, it, it, it's, it's a huge difference in uh, frequency from all of these. The gamma rays created when atomic nuclei decay. Uh, in the 50s, gamma ray emissions were predicted as the product of, it, of um, the interaction of cosmic rays and interstellar material by Philip Morrison. And, so he was the guy who first theorized they had existed, and um, that's when it all started looking for him. In the early 60s, there were balloons and satellites, this satellite called Explorer 11 that first measured gamma rays. But the tests weren't really conclusive. They really didn't know what they were looking for, and the levels were below what the models predicted. Then in the late 60s, whoops, sorry about that. In the late 60s, um, Gamma ray bursts were detected with the first Vela satellites. And the Vela satellite had nothing to do with the trying to detect gamma rays in space. It was, it was supposed to detect Soviet nuclear tests um, on the Earth. So they put this thing up and they start seeing all these bursts. And uh, so the satellite was classified. So gamma ray bursts actually became classified for a while. They were classified until 1973. Um, and bursts became one of the big mysteries due to the large amount of energy. It's like these flash bulbs that go off, that give off huge amounts of energy um, in such a short period of time. In the 70s and 80s, Apollo 15 and 16 detected gamma ray back, uh, background radiation, and then several satellite balloon missions detected it after that. So now we're about mid-70s in the timeline, and that's when um, the Gamma Ray Observatory first comes into play. Um, 
the gamma ray observatory was 23 years to cradle the grade, not counting the years it took to conceive it. So I'm going to give you a little timeline from about 1970 to 2000. The total cost of the program was $617 million, which when you compare it to some of the other observatories, it was actually quite a deal. It was the highest payload shuttle payload ever launched as of that time. Um, I have a colleague here, an old colleague, he worked on Chandra actually, and, he, and Chandra became the heaviest one probably after this. He said that Chandra was the heaviest one up to that time. That was quite a bit later than the GRO. How heavy were they? And I will cover all of that. Um, there's a little weight thing, it's on the next page, I believe. Um, so we announced, the, we announced the opportunity in 1977, and TRW and Redondo Beach was awarded the contract in 1981. Um, the concept reviews, and the design was in, in those 83 to 84. So all of this time period right in here was design reviews and trying to figure out how you're going to create a satellite that will accomplish the science mission that they wanted. Um, and it started being built about 1983 to 87. And that was, again, all the instruments were not built in California. Some, uh, one was built in Germany and it was taken there. I'm not sure where all the rest of the instruments were built. But all the integration and test was done in Redondo Beach, California, which is right by the airport in Los Angeles. Um, the launch target was 1988. So that wasn't so bad a year by 11 years. But then something happened, challenging. And it happened in actually 1986, January. So that, that, that changed everything because they had to find the source of the, the accident and, um, and moved a lot of the launches around. It turned out that uh, GRO was finally shipped to Florida about 1988. And uh, final integration and test was done there, final integration test and checkout. So it goes, you know, you have instruments that are built in different parts of the world, built in California, flown to, flown to Florida, taken to a facility very much like the one in California, integrated, tested again, integrated to the shuttle, and then finally we get to the launch. The launch was in April of 1991. We had about nine years of high orbit operation. And then it was deorbited in uh, year 2000. The reason it was deorbited, it was uh, there was a gyroscope that failed, and there was there was a real fear that the satellite might just come crashing back to Earth. And it was gonna it was a high probability, not high probability, but a significant probability that it could hit where uh, people lived. And there was 12,000 pounds of material, including six 1,800-pound beams that landed in the ocean, and thousands of bolts. So this was a huge thing. Um, supposedly it was the largest unclassified thing that was put up in space other, uh, next after Skylab. So it was a pretty big, and Skylab, as we all know, you know, did come crash into Earth, so they didn't have <coughs> that happen again. Um, just to show you where I fit into all this, I joined TRW in 1985, and had any satellite experience, but a lot of modeling and simulation. And what I did was I ran simulations of the, of the satellite, you know, of all, all different cases of the pointing systems and the, how the, uh, the antennas interacted and this, this type of thing. Um, I developed the simulation for all the fault of logic and the pointing stability. And then, I, um, and then I went off, I did that for about the first two years, then I went off and worked in um, um, some different programs. And I ended up leaving the, the TRW in the West Coast and joining the operations team in 1989. So I got there about maybe about a year and a half before launch. So, and then I was there until about um, 1991, so about two years after launch. Um, so how did GRO fit in with NASA's grand vision? This is where I'll talk about, the, I'll compare the weights a little. The four telescopes um, uh, were observing light from gamma rays to infrared. And these are the four telescopes that were NASA's grand, grand observatory. And three of them are still up there. So there's the Spitzer, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Chandra, and GRO. So you got gamma rays, X-rays, visible light, little infrared, <coughs> and Spitzer, which is infrared. Uh, the X-ray and the Chandra, uh, X-ray and the infrared were added in the 70s. And the goal is to have all four of them up at the same time. <laughs> Didn't really turn out that way because of the GRO, but that's, that's the way it goes. Um, three of the four are still operational today. Hubble, Chandra, and Spitzer. So they're still all flying. Uh, this, is, this is a little comparison of the, I don't know the weights on here. The weights will come a little later. Um, I think the weight, the weight order, GRO, just to give you an idea. GRO from end to end would about fit in this room. Really? Yes. Holy and um, slow. Yeah, 30, 36,000 pounds. Holy yeah. gosh. Um, so the Spitzer, this is a different orbit. It's really, I, I didn't realize this until I, I went and looked it up at the talk. But the Spitzer is in an Earth trailing orbit. So it's, it's following the Earth around the sun, which is kind of cool. Now the Chandra is in this hugely elliptical orbit, 14,000 by uh, 
83,000 kilometers, and takes about 60 hours to orbit the Earth. Hubble Space Telescope is going to wrap a circular Earth orbit about 500 kilometers around the Earth. It takes about 90 minutes, 93, 95. And the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory was also in the low Earth, just about the same. These are the launch dates, so we launched not that long after um, Hubble, and Hubble was still, um, I'm not sure if it was actually repaired by this time, which brings a little issue, you know. The naming satellites actually became very sensitive for GRO, and GRO wasn't named until after, about six or six to nine months after it was launched, because Hubble, uh, the Hubble family wasn't that enamored with all the problems with the Hubble Space Telescope, because in those days, Hubble was not maybe known as something successful until they fix the mirror. So it's a little sensitive issue. So we, so I'm probably going to say GRO a lot in this talk because that's what we called it. We never called it the Compton. It, it was just something that was kind of foreign. It was something that happened after launch. So let's talk briefly about the science and the instruments. Um, this is a little quote about, about the, what, what the Gamma Ray Observatory found. Um, there was four main instruments on the, on the satellite, and these are the acronyms, I'll talk about each of them. The first was this one called BATSI, uh, Burst and Transient Source Experiment. And BATSI is on the eight, the GRO is just a big rectangle, and a big, I mean cube, like an elongated cube. Um, and so there's eight corners. In the BATSI, there's, four, there's 40, there's one there, there, here, and there. And then they're on the other side too, so they can they can see the entire sky. Um, and and the main thing that they found was that gamma, gamma ray bursts happen all over the galaxy, um, uh, the universe. I mean, not just in our galaxy. But one of the theories that they were, they were going to be concentrated on the galactic plane, but they look they just happen everywhere. So that was a kind of a unexpected result for the um, for this experiment. It was a, a real game changer for everything. Egret um, was a, a full sky survey. It discovered 270 sources. 171 had no un had unknown origin, and that's why they wanted to have all the telescopes up at the same time. Because if they find a gamma ray source, they could point uh, the X-ray one at it, or the visible, or um, uh, the infrared, to see if there was anything else there. Um, the Comptel was the, the first mega electron bolt device that was ever flown on satellite, and it really, it really was a big unexplored region for gamma rays. And its main, re its main purpose was to map galactic concentrations of radioactive aluminum, aluminum 26, to study star, star formation. And um, the last one is this OSI, which is this one right here. Um, it did low gamma ray, looked at low energy gamma rays, a comprehensive analysis of the galactic center. It also looked a lot at the sun. An interesting thing about OSI was that it, if you they're a little difficult to see here, but these, these detectors can move. So there's four detectors, and they can just move all the time. So the satellite had to take care of that, so it continued pointing well when these detectors were moving. They didn't move constantly. They would move when you went in and out of the sun. Or um, maybe they, they're looking at a certain target, and they want to get a little background reading. They could do um, measurements of that type of thing. So it was, that was, the rest were just more or less passive devices. Uh, where somebody came in and they just got the reading out of it. This is the astronauts with along with along the shuttle. Um, Jerry Ross, not related, I don't think, but maybe. <laughs> um, uh, these are the two guys. Uh, the reason they're in spacesuits is because they end up going out in space. And they, um, when we deployed, we had some problems, and uh, you'll you'll hear about that at kind of the end of the talk. These guys were great. Uh, I only met them a couple times, but they're the, the nicest guys to work with you'd ever find. Um, this was the entire operations team. Okay, so when you think about a big observatory like this, you know this was it. And, and in this picture, there's five astronauts and four administrators. So it was five engineers and um, ten operators, and it was augmented with about 30 engineers from TRW when we launched. And the NASA and science, those guys aren't included in the photos. So that's kind of a separate team in all this. This was a team that was responsible for operating the satellite, making sure that all the science came down so that the scientists could see it all. Um, I'm right there. Long time ago. Um, and let's see. And this is, this is our site manager, smartest manager I ever had. So he was really a great guy. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about the satellite. I'm going to talk about a general description, everything except the instruments. Um, uh, I'll talk about how you define requirements that define what the satellite is supposed to do. And then I'm going to talk about
about the design, how things work. I'll talk about the communication system, power and temperature control. I'll talk about how you determine where the satellite's pointed, how you want to stay pointed at a certain target. I'll talk about how you maneuver between targets and um, how do you raise and lower orbits. And then last is what do you do if something fails? So I'll give you an idea. Hopefully you'll be able to walk out of here and understand how, how to do all those things for a satellite like this. And it's very similar from satellite to satellite. Then I'm going to talk about operation a little. I'll talk about after we launched and the shuttle release and then our operational experiences. So this is, this is a, the weight comparison right here. Uh, so GRO was the longest, it was the largest lofted by the shuttle at that time. Um, so it was 36,000 pounds. The, hub, the Hubble was 24,000. Now, in the Chandra's, was, I had 13,000, but that doesn't include its booster because it had to be put up to a higher orbit. You know, the Hubble, the shuttle, I mean, I'm sorry, the GRO and the Hubble, they're just dropped off by the shuttle. But the Chandra, that was taken to a different orbit, and so was the Spitzer. So that's the satellite, not including the booster. Voyager that we saw, that's about 1,800 pounds, you know. Um, and Teeters was a communication satellite, that's 7,000 pounds. In each of the four instruments, they both weigh about 4,000 pounds. And then there's 4,000 pounds of rocket propellant on board so that we could boost the set, we could boost the orbit up and down. So right there, you're already up to almost 20,000 pounds just with the instruments and the propellant. Um, so to give, you a, to give you an idea of the size, it's length 24 feet. Its width was 14 feet, and its height was 13 feet. I measured it before. Right from, from black, black to uh, this to the other side over there is 20 feet, so a little further than that. The, uh, the width of, the, of this is 10 feet, so a little further out. 13 feet is the high as the ceiling, so that, that's the basic size of the whole, of the whole satellite. Um, there's an antenna boom down there that's 20 feet, goes 60 degrees down from the body, and there's these there's, uh, that MTA stands for magnetic torpedoes. Each of those weighs 100 pounds, and that dish down there is a five foot diameter dish, five foot diameter. Um, and the total width is 70 feet. And if you go from the back here all the way up to the, the back of the auditorium, that's 74 feet. So, I mean, it's an enormous machine when you, and it's, uh, you know, just to move the thing around, it's kind of amazing. Um, the two solar arrays, uh, can, can, can both articulate. I, I had a little hard time getting good art for this because this is what I have from old photos, so you're probably going to see this picture a lot for reference point of views. But the, the, the solar rays could rotate this way, and they could rotate plus 90 degrees back that way, each of them independently. And the high gain antenna could move, and then that Aussie head <coughs> and that could move. This was a picture of the assembly facility. Uh, this was in Redondo Beach. Um, you get an idea, just imagine the tools. These are just the tools that you need in order to lift it. It had these big rods that came out so you could lift the whole satellite up and down. And these guys, and um, they're, you know, working on something. It doesn't look like this was before they assembled on the solar arrays. I'm not even sure, the solar arrays might have been assembled actually and integrated when it, when it got down to Cape Canaveral. It might not have been done at TRW because there would be no reason to put it on there. Um, but it's tremendously huge piece of thing. You get a good idea of the instruments. These, these are that Batsy instrument. that are looking out at the, at the uh, ones here, one here. Then they're out there on this, the, the, all, all eight corners of the satellite. So let's talk about the requirements. What do, requ what do we need requirements for? Um, the way you design the satellite is you, you define requirements. They just say what the satellite's supposed to do. So for example, this is a bunch, a bunch of different um, requirements that I'm going to talk about individually. It's got to point anywhere in the sky, and it's got to hold it to within 0.28 degrees. It's got to, you got to know where the satellite is pointed to within 0.024 degrees, so an order of magnitude. This huge beast, you got to align everything just to be able to do these. It's got to rotate 180 degrees in less than an hour. So if I'm, if I'm here, and I want to, and I, or if I'm looking at that side of the stage, and I want to rotate over to here, I got an hour to do it. Um, I have to power and heat and cool the satellite. So there's three, three things I have to do there. I want to reboost the satellite when the orbit decays. And then I got to assure the satellite is always safe in the presence of a failure. And then I got to fly out of so with minimal ground intervention. I might only see the satellite 30 minutes for every three hours that it's flying, something like that. So I take, what I do is I take these requirements and I break them down even further. So this bottom one means I got to, because I can't see the satellite all the time, I got to store all the science uh, data on tape recorders. 
Then I got to transfer the data from the satellite to the ground station. I point a five foot diameter antenna to transfer the data. So there's, uh, we're going to talk about how we meet all these different requirements for the hardware. And this is just a small subset, you know, the requirement documents for a satellite, you know, they, they might be that high with all the different parts that you have to build because there's electronics and hardware and mechanical and everything in here. So let's talk about what devices are needed to meet all these requirements and the devices that are on the satellite in the end. Um, when I talk, I, I'm going to have sensors. And the different types of sensors I have on the satellite, I have star trackers. They measure the location of stars. I got gyroscopes. They measure the satellite's rotational speed as, it move, as it's turning. I have sun sensors that measure um, angle to the sun. I have fine and coarse. Um, the coarse sun sensors are at the ends, edges of the uh, solar arrays. And the fine sun sensor looks out in this direction. The star trackers are on the opposite side. You don't have to look at the sun and the stars at the same time. And I have a magnetometer that can measure the, the Earth's magnetic field um, in, in three dimensions. I got actuators, a bunch of different actuators. I have reaction wheels and magnetic torquers and thrusters and antenna drives and solar array drives. I have communication. I got a low gain antenna and a high gain antenna. Um, I have power and thermal and I got computing. Get this, this is my favorite part. 64K of memory, that was it. That ran the whole cycle. <laughs> It was core memory. How many people know what core memory is? There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had to wrap my own core memory. Hey, you know what? It doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't flip if it gets a cosmic ray hit. It, not, nothing happens to it. That's why it's beautiful. When they first put up the Tiger satellites, that was one of the first a communication satellite. It was one of the first they put up with um, silicon ships running it. And they didn't know. They, they kept getting, they called them single event upsets, it's just getting blasted all the time. They'd have to reload the software every day to this thing when they first put it up, believe it or not. Uh, but not with core memory, <laughs> it ain't going anywhere. So, and there's a backup computer. So what I'm going to do is I'll talk about how we use all these different things to, to achieve those, uh, the different requirements. So how does the hardware achieve the requirements? Talk about the first two items and right here. So I'll go through each of these individually give you an idea on how everything works. So we'll talk about communications first. When I, talk, when I say telemetry, it's, just, it's all the measurements that are done on the satellite. So it's, it's, it's the, it, it might be the angle of the high gain antenna on the bottom, or it might be a temperature of, of some temperature sensor, or a switch if a heater is turned on, or all the science data. So it's basically everything that's on the satellite that we want to transmit back to ground. How we did it was we transmitted the ground via Tigris. This is, this is idealized, uh, but the idea is that there's three Tigrises, and you put them about 120 degrees out of orbit, and they're geosynchronous. And this is the Earth down here, the blue, there's a ground station, and GRO is going around. This is the scale. So Tigris is about 26,000 miles out there. Oops, um, let me just go back. Tigris is 26,000 miles out. GRO is only um, 400 miles, about 300 miles, 500 kilometers above the Earth. So what if I want, and I can't see the ground station here, so how do I get the data down? Um, I have, what I do is I point an antenna at Tigris for, uh, for really high rate communication, and I have to point it within about a half degree. I got real-time communication here is at 28 kilobits per second and then 512 kilobits per second for the tape recorder. I got two tape recorders, about three hours each for full capacity. So what I do is I, in order to communicate, I set up a link between GRO and Tigris, and then the G, and then the Tigris sends it to the ground station, which is with White Sands, and then the uh, White Sands uh, sends it to Goddard. Goddard's the unmanned space flight center uh, for NASA. When, and if I have a different orbit configuration, let's say GRO is flipped around, you know, it's gone around the orbit, now it's over here. What I do in this situation, I can't use that top one. I got to use the bottom Tigris, Tigris B. And I, um, I communicate through that, and then the next one is I send it to the ground station. So um, this, is, this is how all the communication works for all, most of the low Earth satellites. It's like when you said the Chinese satellite, they have a satellite out there at the L2 point, you know. I didn't know, I didn't know I was surprised. I thought they were using the orbiter. I but, thought they were too. Yeah, to, to <clears throat> kind of like this, where you could store the data on a tape recorder or in memory now, and then uh, dump it when you get view of the Earth. But, it's kind of complicated. They must have other uses for that satellite. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so look, the high gain antenna's always got to be able to point within within a half degree. So you have to know three things in order to point the low gain antenna. You have to know 
where the GRO is, you've got to know where the teeters is, and you've got to know the angle, the attitude of the satellite, so that you can figure out where to put that antenna. If you don't know the attitude of the satellite, there's another boat that you can operate in, and there's these two antennas. You can kind of see one points this way, and one points down. And what they do is they give you half hemisphere views each, so that you can communicate with the satellite. You can't get any science data through it, you can't dump the tape recorders on it, but you can read a lot of the telemetry and send commands back and forth to the satellite if you need to. Um, so, and, and we, we did utilize that several times during the, the mission. Um, in terms of power and temperature control, we'll talk a little about the cell, solar arrays, the batteries, and the heaters. Uh, again, TRW is in this 28 and a half degree inclination orbit. It's the same inclination, it's the same latitude, as, uh, as Cape Canaveral. So you just shoot it straight out and you go 20 and a half degrees. Orbits are about 93 minutes in duration at 450 kilometers. That's now what we typically had was a 30 minute communication every other orbit. It took 20 minutes to dump tape. So the, the operators, and there would be just two guys typically um, after normal operations started and they would fight, they, they'd get the communication, they'd look at the state of health and then they would end up dumping the tape recorder. If we have about 50% of your time is in the sun, 50% is in eclipse because you're just in this lower orbit going around the sun. The way you do is you've got to articulate the solar rays to point at the sun. And you store the energy in batteries, so when you're in eclipse, you can actually um, power the rest of the satellite. The total power for the satellite is 4,000 watts, which is actually a, a pretty huge for a satellite. So these can turn. So if the satellite's pointed back, I can rotate the solar rays. If it's pointed down, I can rotate them up. Rotate them up so that they can always point at the sun. Um, then there's temperature, there's a bottom view of the satellite. There's temperatures maintained with coatings, louvers, heaters, radiators, all types of things. Um, the satellite backside right here, we'll call this the backside, um, and this is the front. This is if I took the satellite and flipped it over. So the, um, the, uh, what we're doing is we're actually looking at this side of the satellite from the bottom. Uh, so it got flipped 180 degrees over. Uh, the back side is very temperature sensitive. That's where we had our star trackers and our gyroscopes. And the temperature was typically there, um, was maintained within about 5 or 10 degrees during the whole mission. And if you don't, you can't, um, uh, it's very difficult to maintain uh, knowledge of where you're pointing. There's heaters to heat the warm areas and uh, the cool areas and radiators to reject, radiators to reject excess heat. The How hot did it get? I'm sorry? How hot did it get? Um, you know, I, I'd have to go look. It's tremendous. It like changes hundred degree, hundreds of degrees, on the, maybe 150 degrees or something like that. I honestly can't remember, but it's not like two degrees or something on the solar arrays. When you go in and out of eclipse, the temperature of the arrays ch changes a lot. Oh, I, I, can, I can find that out. I just honestly can't remember. But you can maintain certain temperatures really, really precisely, and it's important to do that. So Comtel had this, uh, you can see the louvers right here. They open and close, so they um, could reject excess heat if you needed to. And then the propulsion tanks, which were all underneath here, this is just a big thermal blanket, which is all underneath here. They had heaters, because they would, they would tend to get cold and lose heat. So this thermal blanket, like I said, it covers the bottom of it, just closes everything in the bottom of the satellite. Um, so next, we're going to talk about where's the satellite pointing. So how do I figure out in space where it's pointing? We call it the attitude determination. Attitude, I don't know how common a word that is, that's just where, that's just the angle that you're pointed at. That's all that means. Um, but I'm going to use an example using cars, which is a linear example, because it's almost <coughs> exactly the same. So suppose I got a vehicle, it's going 60 miles an hour. You know, how far would we go in an hour? We could probably all figure this out. Speedometer measures vehicle speed, and I assume the driver's got a clock, so he knows when an hour's up. So one hour later, I traveled 60 miles. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, now, this is, the, this is where it gets more difficult. The speedometer is never going to be perfect. The speedometer says 60, but my accuracy is 65. So I've got a constant rate or a bias in the whole thing. So at this point, one hour later, the car traveled 65, but I think I only traveled 60 based on the speedometer, so I have an error. And uh, we've all, this is, hopefully this is, we've seen this kind of thing happen. No speedometer is accurate. They usually tune them the other way, so your speedometer is usually reading. You're usually going slower than what your speedometer says. Um, so this is just a summary of this. Uh, I can estimate the vehicle position by summing and just measuring the speed over time. So we could say that we're just integrating the rate we're going at. 
However, the errors in speed measurement, they can cause errors in my estimated position. That's the main problem. The errors always exist. You can't get rid of the errors. So if I was in the trunk, sorry, if I was in the trunk with only a clock and a speedometer, and I want to figure out where I am, um, you know, exact estimation is actually impossible at that point. However, this is the key. So if I occasionally look outside along the way, I might be able to tell that my speedometer reading is wrong. You know, if I look out and I think I went 32 miles and I say, oh, I've gone 32 and a half, I can maybe say my, my speedometer is not right. I got a little bias. How can I fix that? Um, so just an occasional reference measurement, even every once in a while. They don't even have to be synchronous in time. They just got to get a little reference every once in a while. That's the key. I can estimate the bias over here, and I can estimate the actual position. It can be updated. And that to determination in a satellite, it works exactly the same way. What we do in a satellite is we measure the rates and we sum them over time to compute an angular displacement. So we just measure how fast we're rotating about some axis and we, can, and we get an estimate of where we're at. And then the star measurements are an absolute reference used uh, to correct our, any, any errors in our gyroscope measurements that are measuring the rate. And, uh, and if I don't have star measurements, it's kind of like being in the trunk. I mean, I can't update anything, and I just have to go based off of uh, the measurements that I have. So the gyroscopes measure angular rate, and redundant gyros exist for each axis, so that if I have a, uh, so if I lose one, I can continue the mission. And they're just sum over the um, integrate to get me an estimate of the rate. And those are done about four times a second. So I just get rate out of here, I sum it all up, integrate it, and I get an estimate of the attitude. But I know it's not going to be correct because I got gyro errors. And gyros, and our gyros on GRO, they drifted about a degree an hour. It doesn't sound that high, but um, when, you're, when you're pointing air, it's 0 0.024 degrees. A degree per hour is actually a pretty significant number at that point. So Star Trek provided absolute angular position measurements. And, they, and what we did is the Star Trekers, they took a long time on GRO to get the measurements. I'm not sure what the present technology is, but I'm sure it's faster than this. It took about 32 seconds to get um, to figure out where you were pointing. We would take those measurements um, and then we would pass them through what we call the common filter and they would update our rate bias and angle updates. And so we would just be able to kind of correct this whole thing with the gyro measurement and the star trackers. Um, and the common, the common the guy, the guy, he figured this out around 1960. And this basic scheme is used to this day. So you just get something to measure your rate, something to measure your absolute position. You can combine it all to come up with an estimated attitude. <clears throat> uh, pretty, I mean, it's amazingly precise for a device that, that huge, right? Point oh two four degrees. Maybe <clears throat> arc seconds. So how do we point the system at a target? This is uh, basically just Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. <clears throat> and how it works is this. Suppose I got a small wheel right here, and it's just attached to a big wheel right there. And I got a wheel electric motor between so it can start turning. What, I, what happens if the wheel rotates in one direction? The little wheel starts rotating in one direction, the large mass rotates in the other. That's all that happens, it's, and, it's for, and it's just Newton's third law, very simple. The rotation of the wheels and the mass are proportional to their inertia. So if I got that wheel up on top, let's say it's a thousand times smaller um, than the big mass, and the, and the top wheel is going at a thousand RPM, flying around. Bottom mass is going to be going at one RPM, the opposite direction. So we use this kind of concept in order to um, control position of satellites in space. These are called reaction wheels, and they're used on, on all kinds on many satellites. We uh, GRO has them, Hubble has them, Chandra. I don't, I didn't really look too much into Spitzer, but they likely have them too. And this becomes the, other, the next problem. Suppose I got this blue block over here, and I want to put it on the other side of the mass. How do I do that? Um, again, I can use the same thing. First, I spin up the top wheel in a counterclockwise direction. And uh, as soon as I spin the top wheel, the bottom mass starts moving. And well, what do you know? As it's rotating, this blue little block moves around, moves again. And then I start slowing down that top wheel. I spin down the top wheel, and the large mass stops moving, and the mass is on the other side. So if this was a a uh, telescope and it was looking in this direction, now it's looking over in this direction. <coughs> so it's very basic how uh, we use it. These are just called reaction wheels. The same scheme is used if something pushes on the satellite from the outside. So and there's a lot of external disturbances in space. I'll, I'll talk about those in a couple of slides. So if, I'm, if I got the solar rays and something pushes me this way, I use the reaction wheel just to 
push me back. And if it keeps pushing me that way, I have to keep spe spinning up this wheel faster and faster to uh, push the satellite back. <clears throat> so this, I'm going to talk, the disturbances in the space, they are the things that act on the satellite and try to turn it. And there's these, these are made, the five major disturbances that we had on Gamma Ray Observatory. First is gravity gradient. Gravity gradient is truly the disturbance that happens because the gravity at one end of the satellite is different than the gravity at the other. Um, as you guys are sitting there right now, the gravity at your head is different than the gravity at your feet. Hard to believe, but it's very small. But there's nothing to stop this thing from rotating, so very, very small torques make it rotate. There's aerodynamic effects, because the atmosphere is not gone at 500 kilometers. It's still there significantly. The, uh, there's solar torques, kind of negligible, and probably the, comp the, uh, the radiator gives you some torque too, although it's very close to the center of gravity, so it's not going to rotate too much as the photons leave the, uh, um, the, set the satellite. And then the shuttle plume. So we're on the shuttle, we get released, and there's some thrusters that push out. Um, and that's going to hit us, and that's going to turn us too. And then there's Ozzy slew. There's, there's things inside here moving back and forth, and then the antenna moving. So all those things are going to uh, move us around. On, on satellite, rather than having three, at, it's a, it, it can point anywhere in space. So rather than just having three wheels, there's actually four wheels to compensate for the external and the internal disturbances. And the wheels are not aligned with the spacecraft, so they're not aligned like along X, Y, and Z. They're kind of in a weird pyramid position. So in case one fails, I, um, I, I can still have redundancy and continue the mission with just the three. Each wheel, uh, oh, that's fine here. Each wheel here weighs uh, 90 pounds. Huge, you know, not that big compared to the satellites. Again, the satellites, um, uh, 36,000, but they're significant, and they're about two feet in diameter. And the nominal speed is about 500 RPM. So those things just rotating, rotating, rotating for all that time. Um, this is the front of the satellite right here. So it's this portion. And you can kind of see the wheels. These are the different angles that they're at right there. So that's, that's just a, a conceptual thing, how they're all pointed in different directions outside of the pyramid along the X, Y, and Z frame. So now I want to rotate. I want to maneuver from one axis to the next. Um, the key here is that there's always a single axis that I can rotate about. It always exists. It's pretty easy to think about, you know, like if I'm a skater and I want to spin, um, the axis is through my head, right? If I want to rotate this way, I can rotate around that point. But there's always a single axis. And, uh, and what we do is we orient the satellite from the first to the second target along that axis. So we could just spin the satellite and end up in a different orientation. We use something called quaternions to do this. Um, which is just a fancy way to, 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 to compute the rotation axis of the satellite. The satellite maneuvers, this is some data from the satellite. The, the maximum rate is about 0 0.06 degrees per second. Again, so that is about 180 degrees an hour if you compute it back out. Um, so right here, we're pointing somewhere, we say, hey, go to the next axis. And it takes off, and it goes over, it's all done, and it points here. <laughs> We may have, we try to complete everything during a, one pass, but a lot of times you can't because it, you just might not have time. Um, but it's, oops, very straightforward. Oops, sorry. The, um, the rates are a little different because, I, um, you know, I'm rotating about kind of an axis that's X along X and Z in this frame. Um, so now how do I deal with the external disturbances? Because I do have point, um, I do have constant disturbances. Um, you know, even though I'm going around the Earth, I'm, my attitude is not changing as I'm pointing. I'm always in the same thing. So I end up with some constant biases that push on the wheel. And what I do is, if I like, I if, if I have a torque and it's this direction, the wheel has to spin up in order to push me back. And if I have a constant, that wheel just spins up and spins up and spins up, and it can't spin up because it's just physically impossible. So I gotta get rid of that momentum. I gotta push back on the satellite in a different way. And the solution for Gamma Ray Observatory um, is using magnetic torquers. And we call it momentum dumping through the magnetic torquers. The torquers are right here at the satellite. On the, and each magnetic torquer is about 100 pounds and about four feet long. And the metal, and it's just really a big electromagnet. That's all it is. And you control the currents in, around these coils and um, uh, we first we measure the Earth's magnetic field back here. That's, that sensor's on the back of the satellite over here. And then what we do is we current is commanded to the torquer creating an electromagnet. And it just, you figure out how can you push on the Earth, how, on that magnetic field so that it pushes 
against the, um, uh, the, the disturbance, so it reduces the mean wheel speed. Kind of the cool thing here is that the reaction wheel speed is really a sensor. Uh, it senses the constant disturbance torque. So if the speed keeps, if I see the speed going up, 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 I can push with the torque in the opposite direction, it'll just reduce that speed. Um, there's thrusters on the satellite too. Um, thrusters could be used to dump momentum too. In fact, on Chandra, thrusters are used to dump momentum because it's so far out, there's no magnetic field. Um, there's eight thrusters on the bottom, all the thrusters on the bottom of the satellite. So the instruments are all up here, pointed at the top. Obviously, there's two bats that are looking down too, right here. But there's there's eight thrusters, and they're in. These are pairs of redundant ones right here in the four corners, um, and then there's four thrusters here. And I can control the satellite in any axis that I want with that. There's or orbit adjust thrusters, we call them. So we could change, we could boost the satellite up, or we could re-enter it back into the ocean if we need to. The high-level thrusters are used to boost it after atmospheric drag. And wh what happens is, this is just a, a plot of the solar variations. GRO launched around 1990, which we were at, and this is solar solar cycle going up and down. It's an 11-year cycle. So we, we launch around solar max, and what happens is the atmosphere, it's, it's, you know, it's not only kind of like us who are living, the atmosphere is almost living. The atmosphere gets bigger with solar max, and it gets smaller with solar min. So if you're at 500 kilometers, and you're at solar max, you're coming down fast for GRO. It might come down in a year. If you're at solar min, you might have five or six years before you come down. It's incredibly different, the, 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 the atmosphere effect, depending on when you're at solar max or solar min. <laughs> And you don't have a lot of choice of that. It probably was good we launched here because we were headed towards solar men rather than here. We would have had to boost it a little more often in order to complete the whole mission. In the end, low, the big thrusters weren't used to boost it because we had an early system fail, failure. I'll talk about that when I talk after we release from the shuttle. Um, the last is what happens if something fails? You know, the mission, the whole point is. You design a satellite so that the mission can continue pretty much if any single item fails. You know, so if I use a Star Trek or a gyro or a thruster, all these different things, I have redundant almost everything on the satellite. If I lose my magnetometer, it's not the end of the world because I could put up an estimator and still figure out what the magnetic field is for some of these things. If I go, if, but if I get a failure, what I do is I point at the sun, sun for maximum power and on, on redundant hardware. I just change everything. If I was using thruster A, I mean uh, gyro, gyroscope A, I use gyroscope B. Um, I leave the science mission and I point at the sun. And um, point at the sun, I can stay there forever because I'm taking in power and I'm in a nice safe position at that point. And contingency plans did exist for many multi-situations but never happened. So for example, let's say I lost one star tracker and my sun sensor. I, I, I can still kind of figure out my attitude but maybe not quite as well as if I had a whole complement. Uh, if I lose two wheels, you know, how can I control it? Operational issues are often the cause of entering these safe modes. Um, but luckily, we never entered one of these back in mode. But if you talk to almost any other satellite that you, uh, that's, been, that's gone up, they will have entered a back in mode because somebody sent a wrong command at the wrong time. Um, so let's talk about the launch and deployment and how it all worked. We launched April 5th, 1991. Um, a lot on this, aboard the shuttle Atlantis from Cape Canaveral. Again, put us in a 250 uh, kilometer orbit, 28 and a half degrees inclined to the equator. Um, the deployment began early in the morning of April 7th, so two days after. The, uh, the GRO lift, lifted the GRO, uh, the shuttle lifted the GRO out of the shuttle bay with the robotic arm, and the solar arrays were deployed to get power. And at that point, the antenna boom is right here. It's, it's not hanging out yet. It's, point, it's underneath the satellite. And that was our first problem. So the high gain antenna boom stuff, and they couldn't get it out. They tried over and over to get it out. And the, the really horrible thing about this failure was that it, it occurred during the ground test. And, um, and they thought they had it solved, and so it was still there. The good news, good news, we had astronauts on board. So <laughs> they, they were happy, actually. Because they got to go out and perform an EVA, and um, the, uh, when they went to, uh, and, and they had an EVA plan on this. This was like early plannings for the space station, so they were going to go out later. But they got to go out twice, so they were actually probably pretty happy about the whole situation. They go out and they dislodge the boom, and it gets deployed. So that was all good. I got a little picture here of Jay 
in the uh, seventh day, you know, the GRO. He's got, you can't really see his smile, but I'm sure it's big. <laughs> it's just nice. Um, he was not the guy, Jerry Ross was the guy who actually pulled the boom up. And they didn't know what to do. I mean, I read some of the text uh, before this talk about, and, and you know, he, he was like, man, I just got to yank that thing. I mean, it was like they had no idea how to get the thing out because it was stuck in this um, cloth and bolts and it was kind of a mess down there. So then Giro becomes a big flyer. It's one of my favorite pictures. It's got released with the shuttle, the robot arm, and it, we, it got to take off. This is actually, you get a nice view of the back end of the satellite that I was calling in these instruments. These are the star trackers right there. So one's looking out in this direction and one's looking out in this direction. The sun's over here. You can kind of see the solar rays, they're indexed so that they're pointed at the sun. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, the timeline. So when we got released from the shuttle, from that point, really what happened and how did we get the system operational? So we started early in the morning of April 7th and now it's about 5 o'clock. I was on the ship that started at 5 o'clock. I was not on the deployment ship. The deployment ship was a, um, a group of people, it was more, it was, they, they, obviously their experience was more in all the deployment of everything, though they did have some people like me who, was, who understood the pointing systems, and we were more tied to the pointing systems and everything like that on the, on the satellite. So we got released from the shuttle right there, and the shuttle had to back away. I think it had to be 200 feet away, maybe 400, not really far away. Again, you know, this is 70 feet, this room, so really not far away. And we uh, went to the sun pointing mode, and everything worked, and we're all happy. The wheels are spinning up, it's figuring out where it's pointed, it, uh, the sensors are working, everything's going great. Um, so we had to prime the propulsion system. Uh, because there was all this prop propellant on the satellite, uh, NASA, especially after the uh, Challenger, was really nervous about having all, all of that type of thing in the shuttle bay. So we had these, it was the lines from the tanks to the thrusters were evacuated. There was nothing in them, or so they thought. Uh, they turned out to not be evacuated, and what happened was we got a water hammer. <laughs> and uh, um, it was really a bad situation. Anybody has, who's ever gone away for a few days or weeks and turned your water off in your house and you turn it back on, you know, it goes bam, 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 you know, you might hear that. And that's exactly what happened. Probably no sound out in space, but uh, that, was the, that was what happened. We, we, some of the valves that we commanded to be open to do all this, they shut. And some of the valves we didn't even touch, they opened. So it was, it was a really a difficult situation. The potential for, with hydrazine, it's a really unstable fluid. And uh, you can get this effect called adiabatic detonation. <laughs> it's a great name, isn't it? Oh, Basically, it is just, great. Yeah. Yeah, it turns you on. Yeah, if you just squeeze it up, it blows up. And, and so it could have happened. We really didn't know. And because it was all under the tent, nobody knew really what was happening. Uh, we lost our pressure sensor when we got this thing, so our pressure sensor was reading 500 psi. It was supposed to be about 300. Um, so it was, we did, just didn't know what was going on, but we just had to ignore it, to be honest, and hope for the best, because there was absolutely nothing we could do about it at that point if we had actually ruptured one of the lines. What happens is if you rupture the line and the propellant leaked, it would stay under the tent, and it would essentially eat all the electronics in a really short period of time. I don't remember what short it is, but it was days kind of time frame. And then the satellite would just die. It didn't happen. So we were very lucky we didn't, at least we didn't blow up one of the lines. Uh, we tried to close the valve. This was, this was where I was involved. Not my, not my finest hour. Uh, <laughs> we sent the wrong command. And, uh, and you know, when you're in real time operation, one of the, one of the lessons you, you, you really, you never want to have to just send a command up to the thing. And go to, you're going to the book and looking for it. Because it's not one command. You have, in order to close the valve, you had to send about six commands. But that's the way it was. I had to hear meetings forever how, uh, oh, we only would have tried to close that valve, you know? And we actually did, I just sent it wrong. Um, we had communication problems all night on, a, on one of the teeters. So again, we we're communicating with two teeters. The yellow means it was a problem, and the green means it was great. The bad news was that we had, um, uh, the short ones were all in those teeter seats. Everything worked fine. And we would be on Teeter's West, we did great communication, then all of a sudden it's like we went over the hill and we would just lose it. And we didn't really know why. Um, and it took a while to get that all sorted out. It turned out to not be a problem with GRO, which you would think, because we were the new, new guy of the block, it was a problem with the way the system was uh, processing some of the data. 
Um, during, but during this whole time, we're trying to refine all the additive determination with the star trackers and the sun sensors and the gyros. Because we get released from the shuttle and they, we know where we are. I, I don't remember the exact, exact number, but it was within a degree or two. And uh, you have to constantly correct it. And, and we only had bias measurements from when we had turned the satellite on earlier in the day, and those weren't that good. So and the ones we had measured on the ground. Um, so it was an interesting little problem to try to uh, get, get all the attitudes set up. But, you know, we were doing that over hours. Uh, we finally enabled the we got it good enough so we could enable the antenna pointing, which was really important. We got to dump the tape recorders. Because at this point, if we didn't get to dump the tape recorder, we were going to lose this event. And we would never really have known what happened to the propulsion valve. So by getting the tape recorders dumped, it was a big deal. We could analyze uh, how the propulsion system worked at that point. Then we resolved all the teeters problems, and then it just kind of goes on and on. And finally, you know, real happy, we finally got to normal pointing. So we got away from pointing at the sun and using that as a reference to using just stars and the gyroscopes. So that was the first day. The rest of the operations went on for about two, uh, maybe two to four weeks, and we were uh, we had to do a lot of maneuvers just to calibrate it, make sure all the different requirements for the satellite were met, so that it was met, so that it was qualified to do all the science missions. Um, this, this is, I wanted to show this data, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, this is the errors that we get when we're on the x-axis and the y and the z. The x and the z are offset. They're all supposed to be around zero, but you just can't see them if they are. This is a plot from a paper from years ago. But the, um, the, the requirement was almost this, from the top to the bottom of the plot. And we're actually pointing really well in here, you know, plus or minus a tenth of a degree, something like that. Um, or I mean, way less than a tenth of a degree, 0.05 degrees on X and Y and Z. This is my minimum moment of inertia, mid and max. So um, I had the lowest uh, errors over here. Uh, and what's doing that? Mostly gravity rating, which is just, to, to this day, I'm always like, really? Um, that's the biggest disturbance, but it's the, it's the biggest thing that's pushing you off. These are the rates for two orbits, again. Um, and the reason I wanted to show this was because when you look at the data, you go, well, everything's looking pretty good here, but what the heck's going on here, you know, with these big disturbances? And as we talked about it earlier, there's this instrument, OSI, and it can slew, and it can slew. So these are basically eclipse entrances and eclipse exits as we're going around the Earth. And what, what OSI did, it would look at the sun when you were in the sun, and when you're not in the sun, it would look back at some target. Look in the sun, back at some target. And it just would go back and forth like that all the time. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have this, this, what's going on right here, you know, there's a little rate, big spike on three axes all at one time. And that was caused by the high gain intensity. So we were on teeter cess at one point, we go to teeters east, or the other way around, and uh, we see a little disturbance on all axes. But they're all really small. If I look up here, I can see the blips right there caused by the OSI. They're really doing nothing in terms of the satellite, because the satellite is so uh, and huge, you know, can't do much. So let's just talk about, I'm almost done, a couple successes and anomalies, you know. This is true, too. This is a hard one to believe, but we had two our Star Tracker shades. What happened was one time when they lifted the satellite up, um, they didn't cover the Star Tracker shades, and dirt from the crane fell in them. And um, <laughs> so they, they were super expensive. I remember the PO was like $1 million, like one and six zeros for each one. They didn't, you know, it was from Ball Aerospace. And they didn't even, you know, put like 900,000, 900, whatever. It was just a million dollars. And um, so somebody's job was to pick all the dirt out of the shade. And it's this, this crazy black material that has no reflectivity. And it worked pretty well. But I, whenever the moon was full, I'd always get calls. Hey, we're seeing weird stars, you know, because the moonshine would come into the Star Tracker shade and reflect into the Star Tracker. That was always a problem. Um, uh, if, you, if you go, by the way, if you go, it's, it's worth, it's really, if you're interested in this kind of thing, go read the James Webb report from the last time they just had all these recommendations. I mean, the same problems. They didn't have dirt or Star Tracker shades, but they like used the wrong solvent to clean thrusters. <laughs> Things like that. And they had all kinds of crazy problems that they had. This is true, too. We were actually used by target practice by some unknown South American space radar installation. So when I saw that space radar thing before, it was kind of entertaining. Because for us, uh, and for the guys doing the testing, you know, they see this thing coming over, they're like, man, this is, <coughs> look what Mama said, right? This big square thing that they can just bounce the radar off. So, 
and it would, it would, it would wreak havoc with the comm system mainly. So we, the guy, the operators would be in space, and all of a sudden uh, they'd come for a pass, and they, we'd be unloading an antenna, and they'd have to go and reconfigure everything. They had to go through NASA, the State Department, military. It was some U.S. company that actually sold it to this, co this country in South, South America. So we finally got them to stop using us as tire crash, but it took, a lot, took quite a bit of time to do that. Um, <coughs> corded transformations, another crazy thing, you know. Um, we never were quite sure what the magnetic torque was, was supposed to be. It changed three times during integration and tests. Guys are going, oh, does the magnetic field go this way or is it going this way? And so uh, that, that was the thing. The first initial attitude updates were in the wrong direction. So rather than saying we're pointed here, they, they give us one, oh, you need two degrees on X. The next one, oh, you need four degrees on X. We're like, come on, what you, what's going on? Are you sure it's the right direction? And then, yeah, it was the wrong direction. Cool. So those kind of things are very normal in operations. Billy, my, my manager, his management style, you know, it, it was, this was my favorite thing in operations. Your first decision, how much time do you have to decide something? Always. One time we had, um, I started a long pass and I had all the stuff I had to do. And I moved something out of order and um, like it looked like Christmas out there with red and green lights. And I'm like, oh man. And, uh, but nothing bad happened. So, uh, <laughs> but I knew I had like a 50 minute pass. And I'm like, Billy, I need like 10 minutes and I'll be right back. You know, I said, I'll be back. I'm just going to go out in the hall. I got to think about it. And I uh, came back and sorted everything out. But that's, that's kind of a good way to think, to think about it. How much time does. If you don't decide, and that thing goes over the hill, and you lose your pass, it's going to decide for itself on what it's going to do. So you got to, you have to always have to figure that out. It might be five minutes, it might be five seconds, it might be five days. And it's, and it's, you would always want to know what you want to do. Twenty-five orders or less, you know. That was a good one too. Uh, we had a propulsion failure, so we had a second propulsion failure, which is unbelievable. Uh, and we spun up the satellite two degrees per second. I mean, so this thing's point oh six is its fastest mode typically. And we're going two degrees per second after this thrust failure. And this guy, Bruce, and um, I just happened to be there. It was after I had left. I was in the automotive sector. I came back to, because uh, I was a little link between automotive and, I mean, between the, the design in California and the operations. And this was the guy who took over from me. And this guy was so prepared. He saved the day. And, you know, you just don't think of those kind of things. Like one guy, and he had everything ready to go. And the satellite spinning. We had to slow it down. And he had all the, he had practiced this before. So it was really great. Um, that was one of the, the, you know, operations is kind of like if anybody's ever been in a band, uh, you know, you don't go backward in time. And when there's a mistake, you go forward. And however well you do is how well you practice. And, and that, that is exactly what happened that day. So that's about it. I just want to give you, a, you know, one final thought. This is my favorite, one of my favorite pictures, actually. Because when you see it, you know, you got the satellites going off on this nine mission <coughs> for science. And, uh, but when you see it, when I see it also, I think of all the people who worked on it. You know, there's thousands who worked on it from the scientists, Niels Gerald, he was the chief scientist on the whole thing, to, to uh, the operations, the shuttle, the astronauts, the ground system that NASA built for David Kahn for, it took them decades to build it, right? And we're, we're using it. And so when I see it, it's not, I see kind of two things in the photo. You know, I see the satellite going off, beautiful, right? And that's just this thing. But there's all these people that work on it. So I always think about that a lot. Anyway, there you go. same thing. That's what I tried to cover here. They're all going to try to point. They have to figure out where they're pointing. Um, like Hubble uses reaction wheels. Uh, Chandra uses reaction wheels. But when just Chandra has disturbances, it uses thrusters to get rid of them because there's no magnetic field. So um, a lot of the design is, is very similar, but um, and you use it slightly differently. So because uh, they're, they're all different sizes. The, the, uh, the amount of gamma ray you can detect is, is proportional to the size of the instrument. That's why these things are so big. Um, so, I don't know, does that answer it? In a way? There's a lot of small satellites out there. There's a lot of small satellites out there, too. But you can't do gamma rays. Uh, it's Van Vanguard like one. Yeah. 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 But do they, do they operate the same way? 
Do they operate? Um, no, because they don't have any money. A lot of them, okay? And we had a friend, he, was, he had some bad luck. And I mean, they didn't have enough money to operate the satellite the first night that it was out there. And they all went home, they came back and it was dead. I mean, uh, oh, for God. So. I am not kidding you. This kind of thing happened. I mean, so it's not um, unusual. So, I mean, GRO at least had money to, to operate the operating center and everything like that. But, you know, if you're not looking, something could happen. So, go ahead. I know that the antenna array was, was deployable. How about the solar panels? Were they folded in? Yeah, they were all folded in. You can kind of see, they're like accordions, right? <coughs> so that had to work too. That had a, yeah, yeah, there's a pedal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So those, those folded in and then they kind of scooted up like this. Yeah. And you never told us why you deorbited it. Oh, why we deorbited it? Oh, I'm really sorry. Uh, why we deorbited it? Um, a gyro failed. And um, the, science, the scientists were really, and you could still control the satellite if another gyro failed. Not real well, and they were they were concerned that if another gyro failed, um, that it would just come down somewhere, and they wouldn't be able to control it. So after the first gyro failed, the the the, the, the community, uh, the science community, they and probably NASA more than them made the decision just to put it in the ocean, because they didn't want it landing like in Delhi or uh, yeah, because anywhere between plus or minus twenty and a half degrees latitude, it could hit someplace. There's a lot of water there. But there's a lot of people there too, so that was why it got deorbited. Um, we had one question back here. Go ahead. Uh, if you were to build a comparable satellite today, can you estimate approximately how much smaller either would be? I I think for I I think for gamma ray wouldn't I I don't know I know there's a couple gamma ray um, uh, satellites up there I'm not sure how much smaller or lighter either or not. But again, this was so big because that's how big they wanted the payloads to be. So if a guy comes to you and they say, oh, we, we want to do this type of astronomy, we need a payload, um, he's going it, to, it's got to be this big. And you say, well, I can only do like half of that. He's going to say, well, maybe I can't do all the astronomy I want. So it's really payload dependent on all this stuff. And the stuff we're talking about, go back to your original, your other question, you know, we're deciding the bus, the thing that, that, that carries the payload. So once they figure out what they want for the payload, then the satellite designers get together to figure out how am I going to make this thing Achieve, yeah, and get there and achieve all the science that I want. So they can be all over the map in terms of size um, and everything. Great. All right, let's thank Kevin again. For